so you want to know the ins and outs of managing your money. Well, lucky for you, you're just in time for another episode of Master Your Finances with certified financial planner professional, Kurt Baker. Kurt and his panel of experts are here for you and will cover topics from a legal and personal standpoint. They'll discuss tax efficiency, liability, owning, managing, and saving your money, and more. Master Your Finances is underwritten in part by Certified Wealth Management and Investment and Rider University. Rider offers continuing studies programs for adults who need flexibility. Want to add new skills to your resume? Take a continuing studies course at Ryder University. Now, let's learn how we can better change our habits with Kurt Baker. Good morning and welcome back to another edition of Master Your Finances presented by Certified Wealth Management and Investment. I am Kurt Baker, a certified financial planner professional located in Princeton, New Jersey. I can be reached through our website, which is www.cwmi.us, or you can call me directly at 609-716-4700. Zero, zero. This week, very pleased to have with us again, Dave Trapani, who is uh, with Sandler Sales Training Center of Princeton. He brings over 25 years of sales, marketing, and management experience. David prides himself on helping business owners and leaders gain an edge to move their sales to the next level. After several successful years in sales, Dave was asked to manage multiple business de development teams. His team's consistently delivered results that exceeded company goals. He's been involved in two significant mergers and acquisitions and has taken a keen insight into overall business practices and strategies. His clients come from a range of industries, including financial services, IT, healthcare, and banking. He believes that many sales challenges can be fixed by attitude, process, and technique, and that most salespeople don't know they're doing something wrong. He has a unique ability to help salespeople and business leaders get the best sales results out of themselves and their people. Well, Dave, this is your playground for the last couple of years, let me say. Uh, if, if they, we don't need anybody like you ever, this is the time we need it, so to speak, uh, because uh, we have seen, um, you know, if it, calm seas and this was uh, this was a storm, right? This was like the perfect storm. Everything that could possibly happen to a business has probably happened to everybody in the last couple of years. So tell us a little bit about what you've learned in the you know, since this whole pandemic and the changes in, uh, you know, business atmosphere and what maybe we should start and more importantly, what maybe we should start to do in the coming year as things hopefully start to normalize again. Your yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, Kurt, Kurt, it's interesting to listen to you say my bio because. One of the things that I stress is sales folks without training, they do a lot of things right. They do some things wrong. And many times they don't know what it is, you know, what's right versus what's wrong. What I think the pandemic did is it, it really started to cut, you know, create a wedge between good salespeople and bad salespeople. So folks that were, you know, maybe they weren't struggling pre-pandemic but maybe they weren't having the best results, kind of winging it, they've been exposed. So whether it's not a great job of doing bonding and rapport, or they don't have great follow-up skills, or they have a lot of their prospects or, or even clients end up ghosting them, that's been magnified. So it happens more frequently. Those with good training, good technique, good, good skill sets, I've seen them do much better. So I think that that's what the, the, the pandemic has created is really a divide in a good salesperson versus a bad salesperson. And, and, and the bad news is there, there, there are a lot of bad salespeople out there. And because of that exposure, it makes even really good salespeople look bad because the buyer, you know, just based upon patterns and just based on interactions with other salespeople have a predisposition to, I'm not going to be treated great by their, this salesperson because of the effects of other folks. So I think the pandemic really magnified some of those challenges for salespeople. But what I think it's done also is, and I think now is a great time, I, you know, um, we're, we're going to roll into 2022 shortly, or we're going to be into 2022 when this gets rolled out. And good salespeople, I think, will be well positioned to succeed. I think the best salespeople, the markets are going to take care of themselves, but people that have the right skill sets, the right attitude, the right techniques, 
they will excel for 2022 and beyond. No doubt about it. Um, let me hit the well, pause button for a second. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, one of the things I, I, I always try to emphasize, and I know you've been, you like me, you've been an old time, been around a while. Anytime there's change in the market, there's always opportunity, right? So well, this is one of those opportunities where if you know what to do and how to do it, um, other people are gonna are gonna falter. Well, that opens up additional opportunity for you because now as the market starts to expand, you can maybe increase your share, correct? Because now you're gonna come up and you're gonna really be uh, looking even better than maybe in the past, right? Whereas the other ones are gonna look a little worse because you're gonna they're gonna be quote as you pointed out exposed uh, for kind of the fissures they have in their techniques and how they service their clients. Now the ones that are doing it right and serving the clients well are going to really bubble to the top, right? And they're going to be noticed a little bit more, right? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that statement. It, it, it is exposure time. And, you know, think about this as we roll or as we're into 2022, we've got some economic challenges. We've got inflation. We've got some, you know, some uh, supply chain challenges. We might have tighter pocketbooks at, at the corporate or even the, the individual level. We'll see how that pans out. So as a consumer or as a B2B buyer, I'm going to be more selective on who I do business with, which go back two years ago, you could do pretty well if you weren't a great salesperson because the economy was starting to pick up, things were, were cooking along. But now as we, we're into 2022, my selection as a buyer will be much tighter. That, that, that's my guess. So you're right. If I am good and well positioned, good at, at my craft, I will have better outcomes. Yeah, you, you just, I'm not sure we'll address this now, but maybe at some point we could address the fact that a lot of people are in business now, and especially the younger generation, have never seen an inflation cycle before. And that actually, you know, scares a lot of people, but I think it also adds opportunity because in some cases it adds urgency to decisions. Um, I've had a number of large purchases that I'm going to be making and it's like, hey, We've gotten word from our suppliers that if you don't do something by such and such a date, there will be an increase. So you're kind of like, oh, OK, I guess that thing I might have done in this fall or you know, the spring, maybe I need to do it in the next two or three months because I don't want to pay an extra five or 10 percent. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's actually it's actually a great challenge to be. In. You know, we, we always I always get the question about urgency. How do we create urgency? Mm -hmm. And at Sandler, we will never teach the I only have one of these left. So you need to act now. That is not in the Sandler arsenal or playbook. But what helps us with inflation is exactly what you just said. If I'm selling, say, a consumer product like a generator, that price is escalating. That's up 50% over what it was last year. So instead of saying, hey, listen, hey, Kurt, if I were selling you a generator, I might say, if I were not a good salesperson, I'd say, Kurt, prices are going up. You need to act now. If I might be in that Sandler bucket, I might have a conversation with you about inflation. Hey, Kurt, no need to make a decision today. Can we talk a few minutes about inflation and how it's impacting prices? And that might better inform you on the decision you might want to make, which may actually include making a decision now or just completely postponing the decision for longer term until things normalize a little bit. I'm glad you added that segment to it because that is the other side of it, right? So if you have a bump, you know, they will normalize, right? I mean, it's a cyclical thing. It's a wave, right? It doesn't necessarily go straight up or straight down either way. We sometimes forget when you have these bumps that every once in a while you might have a little pullback because then the demand starts to falter and your supplier's like, oh, I think we might've got a little too aggressive on our pricing. We may have to back off a little bit and, uh, you know, adjust to the market in the other direction. So it just makes it a little more complicated. Um, but as you point out, if you're paying attention, there, there's some opportunities if you really kind of watch how it's all flowing together. Yeah, and, and let's let's think about if I do that as a, as a well-trained salesperson, if I take the tact of inflation can impact your purchase mm -hmm. and I give you two options, option A is, and, you're, and we're gonna be thoughtful about this. Here's what could happen in the short term. We could also talk about what could happen in the long term that there could be a pullback. If I give you both of those options, and this is what I'm saying about bad salespeople being exposed, you will become my client whether it's now because you have the urgency and the need for what I have, or if it's six to 12 months down the road, you're going, I love working with that guy. 
He did not put any pressure on me. And when it's time to pull the trigger, that's who I'm doing business with. And in that entire window, this is where those, I'll call them the weaker salespeople, are going to start to fall out. They're going to start to drop out of the game. Yeah, I think you kind of pointed out in, in a real, you know, in, in an example way, is that how you become more of an educator of 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 the of the consumer and explain to them what the process is and what's actually happening in the market, then they make the decision, right? Ultimately, it's their decision. And if you provide them all the information, at least they feel like, hey, for me, that's the right decision. Like you point out the generator, maybe I really don't need a generator and I can wait a few years, or maybe I'm like, oh wow, I really do need one because the other one's failing and I need to replace it quickly. So maybe that's something I want to prioritize. So you can shift your priorities around saying this is, so this is something I really should do soon, not something I could put off for two or three years. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. As we say, as we say, it's a, it's a joint determination. Do right. we want to do business with you? Do you want to do business, business with me? But the pain, the reason behind it is up to you, the buyer. Right. It's not, that's not my choice. It's up to you. Your urgency is your decision. Very, very, very well said. Uh, Dave, that was an excellent uh, break in. I mean, we got a lot more to talk about. We're going to take a quick break. We're listening about, you're listening to Master Your Finances, and we'll be right back. This is Master Your Finances with Kurt Baker, certified financial planner professional. Learn about tax efficiency, liability, owning, managing, and saving your money and more from Kurt and his experienced panel of guests. Master Your Finances is underwritten in part by Certified Wealth Management and Investment and Rider University. Rider University offers flexible education for adult learners. For more information, it's rider.edu slash next step. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finances. I'm Kurt Baker here with David Trapanti with uh, Sandler Institute here in Princeton. And he's talking about some of the things we've learned during the pandemic. We're kind of separating those who don't have really good sales skills with those who do have really good sales. So this is where we're kind of showing where expertise makes a difference when there's changes in the market. So, uh, Dave, what do you think we should be doing now that we're kind of rolling into 2022? Um, I think we've learned a lot as business owners and, uh, you know, as, as salespeople, so to speak. What do you think we, we should do? To, where should we focus this coming year? Yeah, you, you know, I, I love that question. And I, and I like, well, I don't like the term, but I consistently use it. I'm, I'm kind of a one trick pony. And um, <laughs> I think as we get as we get rolling into 2022, if, if, if I'm listening to this podcast, I'll give you a couple of quick items. One is take a moment and go backwards and determine who is your best fit client. Where really do you win the most amount of business? You know, identify those characteristics, where their location is, the size of the organization or the type of individual it is. Whatever characteristics you can come up with, get them down on paper and double down. Start looking for more folks or businesses like that. That's number one. The second thing is, and, and I think I would say, Business, salespeople have gotten away from this, but back to the basic goal setting and trying to look look at what do I want to achieve, achieve not only during the year of 2022, but quarter by quarter and then month by month and start to normalize what, what do I want to achieve in January, February, March, and really start to look at that run rate, that trend, because I want folks to get back to if things aren't going the direction I want, I can refine it early. And if they're going the direction that I want them to go, then I can double down on certain activities that are actually working. I do believe that over the last couple of years that, that we've seen a lot of individuals, a lot of organizations not be so fine tuned on their goal setting and their business planning. So I think tightening that up makes a ton of sense. Kurt, I'll throw one more thing in there, uh, uh, which is, I, you know, we're here, we're doing a podcast. Um, today, th technology has changed so quickly in the last 18 months. It's, it really is, if you haven't fully embraced all of these tools that are at our disposal, be it a Zoom or a go-to meeting, um, different video uh, options, and moving maybe some of your sales opportunities to those virtual sessions, you might be missing out. Now, I wouldn't say that across the board that that's applicable to every salesperson and every business. But what I will say is most businesses 
have an opportunity to leverage these tools. And if you're not leveraging it because of fear or you say that doesn't work for me, if that's unfounded, you're missing out because I'm watching tons of salespeople close big deals using these tools and operating so much more efficiently than they were just two years ago. So embrace the tools that we've got kind of, we were kind of forced into them, but boy, they give us some great outcomes. No doubt about it. Yeah, I have to agree with that. I mean, one of the, one of the challenges always when you come up with new technologies, you, you may learn it as a business, but your customer base may not know it. Well, I think we've all been forced into learning this technology at some level. So I found many, many clients that I, I work with, there are people that would not, wouldn't have ever have gone on the tech side. And now some of them have really embraced it and they prefer it in some cases, right? Especially if you commute or if you're busy, uh, some of this technology really is a big time saver and it makes it much more efficient. And that doesn't mean you get rid of the in-person side of the, of the relationship. It just means you kind of add in, there's more touches, more ways to communicate with them in a more efficient way is really what I see happening is I just see it allowing you to be have a better connection with your clients as opposed to a, a you know a lesser a, a connection so to speak it's just better it's just another way to do it yeah th th think about this kurt you know in, in in today's world let's imagine you're a client of mine we can meet on a virtual platform and the the, the systems the tools that are out there are so easy to operate and again as i'll speak from a salesperson's perspective some of our clients may not be as and by the way, I'm not the most technologically advanced person. So some of our clients may not be even up to my level, but hey, listen, I'm gonna send you a link. Simply click on it. We'll get organized when we get there. Make it easy for that person to get there. So as a client, you're spot on. I can see you more frequently. Now as a prospect, and again, biz different businesses operate differently, but let's imagine in 2019, my first meeting was driving an hour, hour and 15 minutes to a first sales meeting. And maybe that meeting was 30 minutes. Well, I've just spent three and a half, four hours in the car doing the meeting and heading back to the office, all that downtime. We can shift these meetings to these virtual platforms. And to your point, we can be done in 30 minutes. That's good for both of us. That's a good use of time. Maybe that second meeting moves to an in-person meeting. Right. And then I'll go with just one step further. There are awesome video capture tools I don't know what the right way to say it, um, but for example, I use a tool called the Vidyard. I get folks calling me, hey, how would you handle this situation? Or maybe I wanna just send a nice note to somebody, it's their birthday. In about 60 seconds, I can record on my phone or on the computer, either one, and send you a personalized message. And it, it hits home with those folks. So they're getting more touches. So embrace these tools, they're out there, they are not difficult. Maybe, you know, maybe we, we do need a little bit of coaching to get through them, but it's not an exhaustive, I need to go for 12 weeks, one hour a week for a class. It's literally have someone show it to you one or two times in 20 minutes. You can probably record a video pretty quickly after that. Well, that's really cool. That just makes it one more way that you can connect with somebody that otherwise you wouldn't have been able to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Makes it easy. Mm. That That's amazing. So what are some other challenges you're seeing people coming with uh, in 2022 that maybe they hadn't seen in the past? Yeah, so so, so there, there's a couple that, that are really, again, I think that these are being magnified way more than they were in the past. Mm -hmm. I think ghosting, um, the concept of not showing up for a meeting. So we just talked for a bit about using technology and how efficient it is and you know, how easy it is to get to get uh, a meeting completed virtually. It's also easy not to show up. So, <laughs> you know, you drive to some, I, I, I've had salespeople in the past say, hey, I'm going to drive to their office because they have to be there. So they're going to have to meet with me. Well, probably not a great technique, but in the virtual world, there is a little bit of an easy out for a buyer, for the prospect. So how do we tighten up those meetings? So how do we make sure that A, they're calendared? B, we agree that, you know, here's what the outcomes of the meeting are going to be. You know, let's lay out some very clear outcomes. Kurt, when we get together at the conclusion, it could be a no go. We could stop right there or it could be we're going to open up our calendars and get to that next meeting. But if I can tell you what's going to happen before the meeting, 
what the decisions we will make at the conclusion of the meeting, I will have a higher show up rate. So ghosting, you know, I, I look at I look at our new clients. They've been experiencing a lot of ghosting uh, going on. I think the the other piece that's a cha- a big challenge is the world of prospecting. So so we've got clients that are doing cold calling. Uh, we've got clients that are using LinkedIn and the videos, all that stuff. We've got to have a great mix of of prospecting activities. And one of the areas that's become you so so prospecting in a big picture is a challenge because it's getting a little bit more difficult for whatever reason to get in touch with people. Maybe that's because people aren't back in the office. Maybe gatekeepers aren't in the office. So that's a little bit more of a challenge. Um, but people are a little bit of a moving target. And we used to do a lot of networking. So maybe networking has dialed itself down. So we've got to replace that. And then the other piece, you know, my, personally, and other clients of ours do a lot of speaking engagements. Mm-hmm. They go out in front of an audience. And in there, they can they can identify and find opportunity. Somebody in that audience says, hey, I need to do business or at least need to speak with, with the individual up front. Those speaking engagement numbers have gone down and the audiences have gone down. And then again, you start to sprinkle out, um, uh, what do I want to call them? Events, you know, events where you have a table, I'm drawing a blank on the name for some reason. Um, what? Can, oh, when can you help me out on the, oh. what's that? When you, when you, are you when you're tabling at an event? A table about? at an event. Yeah. yeah. I was drawing a blank on it. Yeah. But those are minimal right now. You know, we're not getting the, the volume of, of events that there were in the past. So we've got to find places or, or, or activities that replace those opportunities that give us some good outcomes. So getting back to some basics, asking for referrals, and then being very diligent about doing the activities that I can do, knowing that some of those other events have been dialed back a little bit. So, and I've noticed some, there's been a lot more, uh, maybe you can speak to this a little bit, that, that more and more people are doing uh, educational type webinars and things like that. Have you seen any success with that with some of your clients that have maybe that maybe were speakers and they would do things in person, perhaps they're doing more of the webinar style events uh, than they had in the past? And, and what do you see on the other side of that? Is there becoming a saturation? I know at one point it was like, nobody did it. Everybody did it. And you know what I mean? There's kind of this ebb yeah. and flow of like, well, are there too many webinars out there now? Because <laughs> it seems like now. Yeah. Put it. So what have you kind of seen with that over its uh, current lifespan that we've been seeing in the last few years? Yeah. And, and again, what, what we've seen is is really in a, a, a speed up of, of those um, outcomes. You know, not a lot of people were doing it. Then very quickly, everybody was doing it. And now we're starting to dial that back down. And that's happened really in a shortened time frame. So. What I'm saying for 2022 is content is king. You got to have good content. You've got to check your frequency. And, and I'll give you a great example. When the pandemic hit, we were doing weekly presentations and we were having great attendance. Uh, we weren't charging for any of those also, great attendance. That fizzled out after about a quarter, three mm-hmm. months, that started to die down. So we've got to be very much on focus on the frequency. Should we be doing these events bi-weekly, mm-hmm. once a month, every other month? Content is king. And then the time. So for when, and when I say time, the time allotted. Um, an hour webinar every other week may just be too much. But a 15-minute webinar every other week, based on your content, may be an absolute home run. So you've really got to look at those different factors. And it's funny because... We hear the term, and I like your term, saturation, but I, I've heard the term zoomed out. Are people zoomed, zoomed out? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I buy into the fact that people are zoomed out. I buy more into the fact that either we've got not great content and we're making people stick around for an hour, or especially in the business world, running meetings. We have an hour and a half meeting. Everybody needs to show up. And in 45 minutes in, everybody in the group is going, why are we here for an hour and a half? Right. And I think you start to look at the saturation of business meetings and then webinars and a lot of wasted time in there is magnifying people's, you know, selection. Hey, I only want to be in places where we are efficient and I'm getting something out of it. And that's what I see zoomed out as 
it's the the outcome of people not running efficient Zoom meetings or whatever the tool is. Right. No, I agree 100 percent. I mean, we're, let's talk about that a little bit more after the break. We're going to take a quick break here. You listen to Master Your Finances. We'll be right back. This is Master Your Finances with Kurt Baker, certified financial planner professional. Learn about tax efficiency, liability, owning, managing, and saving your money and more from Kurt and his experienced panel of guests. Master Your Finances is underwritten in part by Certified Wealth Management and Investment and Rider University. Rider University offers flexible education for adult learners. For more information, it's rider.edu slash next step. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finance. I'm Kurt Baker here with Dave Trapani. And we were talking about being zoomed out a little bit there. And I, I have to agree um, that I think we've learned a lot about Zoom. Initially, hardly anybody was doing it. You got on them. You're like, oh, this is really great. It's a way to do things that we all of a sudden we couldn't do anymore. We can get together with people. Um, but one of the things I noticed, I wonder what your thought is about this. My personal feeling is like when I get beyond like an hour on a Zoom meeting, I, I, my, my attention span just isn't like what it would be right so is there yep and, and you mentioned doing like 15 minute ones and things like that and i i have to agree with that if you have content and you kind of condense it and the person on the other end feels that hey i got a lot out of all the minutes that i was spending there it's it, it's much more value because i mean i actually had a meeting earlier today that was supposed to be an hour and a half and it ran um i, I guess i think it ran just under an hour because the content that we needed to discuss um we finished it up we were done and yep. they cut it. We, you know, freed up 35 minutes, you know, whatever it was, uh, which I think people appreciate. Right. So I, I think what we put on these webinars, you want to make sure you're providing value for the minutes that you're, that you're expending on the other party's part as well. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and Kurt, if you start, if you start there for a second, and I know that this is going to sound really basic, but it doesn't always work out, especially in the business world, which is your example. We, we have an hour and a half meeting, but we're done with the content, say, at the 50 minute mark. There are folks in, in business that say, well, we booked it for an hour and a half. Let's spend the next 40 minutes talking about something else. You've got to be so aware. And, and I, I think there's a little bit of vulnerability of saying, hey, look, we've reached our content. Let's put 40 minutes back onto your calendar and let's keep moving. And if you translate that over to the sales process, it's no different. You know, what, what, what we're teaching when we ask folks that we teach to set up meetings, we say set specific time, time limits. So, for example, if we're going to meet for an hour, we're going to meet for an hour. But if you've covered what you need to cover in that meeting at the 45 minute mark, don't squeeze another 15 minutes out. Right. Put 15 minutes back on their calendar come back another day, just set it up on the calendar, come back and cover the next piece of your sales process. We don't have to cram it in. So as basic as that sounds, that is one of those elements that will kill, not only kill culture in an organization, making people stay too long, but it'll it'll not do well for your, for your sales career, no doubt about it. And I think your point is well taken that you essentially send the agenda of the topics we're gonna cover. And if you finish the topics and you're done, I know we've all been in ease with, okay, well, yeah, as you point out, let's go on to other topics. Well, two things. One, you're going on to something I'm not prepared to have a conversation about necessarily, Bingo. right? So yeah. um, we're kind of just, you're really just spinning in circles and it's not going to be as useful as it would have been if you told me ahead of time, hey, here's what we're going to discuss. And typically you're dealing with, you know, multiple people. Um, so one or more of those people won't be ready. And so yep. you're probably going to have to redo that conversation at some point in the future because things got left out that because they weren't expecting to have the conversation in the first place. Right. So I think your point is well taken. Just end it. Say, look, you know, we'll move on to our next topics at our next meeting. And then you set out the agenda to bring up that stuff. Right. Absolutely. And, and if you're not prepared to talk about a topic, let's look at it from a selling perspective. Yeah. If your prospect is not prepared to talk about a certain topic, that's not helping them either. Right. That's putting too much pressure. So come back and fight another day or have that conversation another day. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I agree hundred percent. So, um, so, so that's awesome. Um, I know some, I, so have you seen people adjust their business? One I heard about that I thought was very interesting is that some of the restaurant owners, of course, they went through a lot of trauma, of course. Right. 
Um, they actually learned, I, I found that some of the restaurant owners, I talked to a, a restaurant consultant and she was telling me that they actually learned how to run their businesses more efficiently, have more time. And what they ended up doing is figuring out what hours of the week really weren't that profitable, right? So they'll literally do lunch, you know, maybe they'll do whatever, let's say two o'clock in the afternoon, close for two hours, reopen for dinner. Instead of staying open from two to four, um, they now just close or they may close on certain days. Maybe, maybe they're not open on Monday and Tuesday, things like that. And what some of them have discovered is that by paying attention to your business matrix, metrics, they actually learned how to be more efficient and actually make more net income because now they're not hiring people. And I think a lot of that has come down to you've got a labor issue going on now, right? And we had the pandemic issue to start with, and now you have a labor issue. So some of them are continuing some of these practices. So I guess that's leading into, have you seen anybody having to respond to maybe the, the labor situation? And the other part of that would be whether or not people working virtually or in person, because we've gotten used to that aspect of it too. So have you seen any changes as far as how people are operating from the sales perspective and a business perspective? Yeah, so so I'm going to take my my twist on that question, which sure. is, you know, from from a delivery standpoint in the world of selling, um, and I'll use me as the example because I because I think we cover a couple of different areas. We're selling, we're training, and we're we're um, coaching, and then and then working with our customers. So most of my training occurs in the morning, uh, where I'm a little bit fresher, and I try to and I train on certain days during the week. I also try to do some selling appointments earlier in the day, probably before one o'clock when I know that I'm at my freshest. So I'm trying to build my calendar around those activities. Coaching tends to come in the afternoon where, you know, I, I'm going to be paying a little bit more attention, um, but I'll get a little bit into a rhythm and I try to stack coaching calls because I can take a lesson learned from one coaching call and bring it into the next. So I'm trying to stack them. So I'm looking for what works best for me as an individual. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is when you look at efficiencies and then embracing technology, client management has become a big deal and it is harder to find new people. You know, pe a lot of organizations that, that, are, that are out there struggling to add new salespeople, new service people, there's some turnover going on. Um, but client management, which used to be, hey, let me hit the road and visit five clients today. I spoke to a sales guy a couple of weeks back He's able to visit 20 clients a day virtually. Oh, so wow. building that into his arsenal now, instead of doing that over a four day period in one day, he can close out all client management in the week. So understanding what works best. And by the way, talk about embracing technology. This is an industry where the belief system is, if you're not in front of your opportunity, you will not close. You will not retain that business. And it's just been proven wrong. Embrace the technology. Your clients will embrace it. And they're getting more touches out of you. They're seeing him more frequently than they were two years ago. And I think it kind of as a side note, if you know how to use the technology, you're going to show that you're kind of up, up on the technology, so to speak. I mean, you are learning things. So that might translate into the fact that, well, if I'm getting advice from you, if you're willing to use the technology, then that means your advice might be better, right? Because you, you're using more tools so you're more impressed with somebody that knows how to use the tools, frankly, because you go, well, they're educated, they understand what's happening and they understand how to, to work with clients. Well, maybe they know more about their business as well, because they're probably keeping up on that as well. Fair, fair. And, and you're looking out maybe long term, the client goes, hey, wait a second. Now I'm not wasting 45 minutes. This is taking 20 minutes to have this interaction. Right. Again, it doesn't mean we stop doing the in person. It's a blended approach. It's a hybrid approach. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100 percent. So um, have you seen any uh, I guess we'll look at the other sides for me. Have you seen any downsides to people uh, like when you have clients who are like, hey, look, I don't really want to do it that way. I mean, is that not has that been an issue or am I just imagining that? Because I know no, something no, it's, like it's, old school, so to speak. Have we had any issues with the old school versus new school ways of doing things? There, there, there are. And, and what I would say, though, is in, in my observation, nothing scientific is that they're minimal. <laughs> they're kept to a minimum. I actually had a prospect say that during the pandemic that they, they, they would only do business with us if we were doing in-person training when nobody else in the industry was doing in-person training. We were OK to say that that's not a good fit for us. But there are random and I, and I would call a very minimal number of clients. In businesses where we're making this transition, where somebody says, yeah, it's got to be in person. 
But I think that that becomes, comes back to the salesperson twofold. One is read the situation. Number one, read the situation and, 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 and adapt. Hey, maybe there are some customers that do need that touch. Mm -hmm. That's okay. But also as a good salesperson, sometimes you need to put your feet down and say, hey, this is the way that we operate our business. And we want you to, you know, we'll meet you halfway here and have a good conversation about how do we get to a middle middle ground here. No, excellent, excellent. Um, so we'll go to the, the training side of this. We haven't talked a lot about the training side of it. I know some of us are better at learning in person. I know when I went to school, I preferred to be in front of a professor. Um, although as we've gotten older, uh, so to speak, you do I do a lot of online learning. Um, so what have you seen as far as that combination goes when you're actually training somebody? Because I know some people are better off if they're right in front of somebody when it's a training situation. Yep. And so how do you kind of act uh, to kind of help them out, so to speak, if they would do a little bit better in person? Yeah. So so, so what, what we're observing is, and, and again, observationally, is the training. We, we, would, we would have always preferred to say in the past, it's got to be in person. Those are the best outcomes. We're seeing tremendous results right. in, in this virtual space. And I think it's a combination of a few things. One is it's using the tools effectively, trying to create what feels like an in-person setting. So using whiteboards, using handouts, um, sending people out to breakout rooms. So really leveraging the technology is getting tremendous outcomes, but it's two additional items. One is our coaching has been dialed up. We're doing more one-on-one -on -one coaching mm -hmm. and that's Zoom, great outcomes from there. And then Kurt, back to our earlier segment, not wasting people's times. Our training sessions, we are right now limiting them to 60 minutes. Sometimes we'll go to 75, not often. At 60 minutes, we are maximizing that time and people are getting a full 60 minutes of training, a little bit of sharing going on in there, but it's not overdoing it with the Zoom. So it's an efficient use of that 60 minute window. And we're finding... I mean, I, I, we're getting client results in for the last six months that are just off the charts right now. Yeah, yeah you mentioned the breakout rooms. I have to tell you, that's one of the things that I found very beneficial. That at first, I was like, I wonder if this is going to really work or not. But um, the breakout rooms are great because you were meeting directly with people that maybe you wouldn't have met with if you were in a room with them. Right. Because you're Absolutely. kind of forced, you know, one or two or three people and like, OK, you guys have to talk to each other. But if I we were all in a big room. You're going to kind of congregate with certain people for whatever reason, and you may not go around and talk to some of the other ones who may actually have really good information. You just don't think to go interact with them. But here, they, yep. you're kind of forced. You move around, literally around the room. Um, I, I found in that particular scenario that I learned quite a bit from other people that I may not have touched in other situations. Absolutely. You've got to recreate what is an in-person setting using these tools. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, the again, these virtual tools are a home run today. And used well, you'll get great outcomes from them. Well, that's excellent, Dave. Oh, oh, sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off. But yeah, that's great. We're going to take another quick break. We'll be right back. You're listening to Master Your Finances. This is Master Your Finances with Kurt Baker, certified financial planner professional. Learn about tax efficiency, liability, owning, managing, and saving your money and more from Kurt and his experienced panel of guests. Master Your Finances is underwritten in part by Certified Wealth Management and Investment and Rider University. Rider University offers flexible education for adult learners. For more information, it's rider.edu slash next step. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finance. I'm Kurt Baker here with Dave Trapani, who is the uh, uh, Sandler Sales Training Center of Princeton. He runs that. And uh, one of the questions I have for you today, Dave, is in this new environment where we're doing a lot of this stuff online, I know personally, everything I do is based on trust. If there's no trust, there's no relationship, there's no business. And I know every business to some extent must have that level of trust or they're just not going to do business with you. When you're dealing with virtually where you may never meet the person on the other end, what are some ways that people could work on building that trust so they can't have a relationship with somebody on the other end? Yeah, Kurt, Kurt, it's a great question because, you know, let's go back to this concept of embracing the tools. I think that there's a big fear for salespeople that nobody buys unless we meet in person. You know, there might be a little bit of that fear, but the reality is, and we're observing it and we're, we're, we're witnessing it is 
you know, there were deals, five figure, six figure, seven figure deals being closed without ever being in, in front of your new customer. So, so what, what's gotta be different? Um, number one is I think it's, it's about looking different than every other salesperson out there. So being genuine. So, you, you know, when I say looking different, it is, you've got to take the time to spend, to spend time doing some bonding and rapport. And that sounds really basic. One of the techniques that, that we're teaching and, and that we fully embrace is something that we say is stay behind the pendulum. And, and, and it's most basic format is, you know, we should be as salespeople actually pumping the brakes on our sales process to slow it down so that the buyer can a be a little bit more disarmed but b doesn't feel the pressure so what might that mean now there's a whole bunch of techniques that we could talk about but but one of the things you know right out of the gate is if you were to meet with me or a sandler trained person we are telling that prospect out of the gate that we may never do business and that a no is on the table so, Kurt, if I were selling to you, you know, one of the first things you'll hear out of my mouth or pretty early on in the sales process is, hey, listen, Kurt, no is a, an available option. If you don't think I can help you, please tell me. And that's got to be genuine. So I'm telling that early. I want to disarm you. The second thing is, and I'm a huge fan of this, and I think the pandemic has really pushed this concept forward. Again, no scientific data, but observational. Slow down the selling process. So what that means is, maybe add an extra meeting. Maybe make that first meeting a little bit shorter and then go to a second meeting and use the first meeting to observe, can we make a connection, rapport? And is there a reason for us to get back together? And if there is, then set up the second meeting. Meeting, Take the pressure off of the buyer. So when you start to think about building rapport, it's really those concepts that are going to do it. Take away some of the pressure, Make sure that we're creating rapport and don't look like that typical salesperson who's saying, we got to do, we got to decide today. Like we've only got one left on the shelf. Remember our earlier inflation conversation? That that would be a no-no. Right. So slow it down a little bit. Yeah, and I think uh, and I think that that's very valid. I'm just thinking as you're talking about all this, I know that uh, almost everything we, you know, any kind of a major decision, people are going to want to do a little bit of their own research on their own end. And they want to kind of double check what you're saying, at least in a basic sense. I mean, there's nothing like dealing with an expert one on one, but there is information out there. There are places you can go to get basic things to do as far as like, you know, if you're if you're going to I don't know if you're going to buy your generator, as you had an example, you can say, well, yep. here's some things that I've learned about generators. Well, you have to talk to the expert and say, well, this is the actual one that works best in your particular situation. Here's why it's the best one for you based on what you're doing. Um, so you got to kind of convert. Uh, the basic information that's out there to the very specific information you need as a buyer to complete the transaction. And that's why we still have people involved in the process because you need those experts out there to really kind of guide the end end part of that process, right? Because very rarely Absolutely. somebody actually knows this is exactly what I want. And it happens, but on larger purchases, you really need an expert to kind of help you uh, making sure you make the right decision. Yeah, and, and Kurt, as, as you talk about what's changed, I think it's it's exactly that philosophy. And, and I like to put it back into the doctor philosophy. You know, um, imagine, I, I had knee surgery a couple of years ago. I'm sure within 30 seconds, that doctor who was pretty skilled knew what was wrong with my knee. But what he did was he slowed down the process. Now, he did a lot of squeezing and twisting and x-ray and then an MRI and spent 20, 30 minutes reviewing and talking and testing things. He spent quite a bit of time and he said, hey, as I suspected, it's your, your meniscus, not a big deal. In sales, pre-pandemic, we were there's a lot of sales malpractice going on. Let me show you what I got. And people were buying. We were getting away with it. But what the pandemic is going to do is if you are not a doctor of your product or solution, you are not going to win the number of deals that you expect. And it's just like that doctor. If I had walked in and within 30 seconds, he sized me up and said, it's your meniscus. Here's what we're going to do for you. I would have called malpractice at that moment because you did not do your due diligence. So slow it down. 
whatever product or listen, you're in financial services. That's a big decision. Mm -hmm. If you're moving too fast, you lose your prospect. They don't follow what you're trying to do. And maybe you didn't do all your due diligence. We've got to slow it down and really do that exploration to make sure our product and the solutions that we're offering are the best fit for that individual. Yeah, yeah, I like the way you describe the doctor thing because I mean that's that's kind of the way you know you, you don't want to be, be uh, pra- having malpractice, right? You want to be doing that, and, and so because you want feedback from your client, right? So part of this process is it's it's really um, a partnership process. If you're doing this, in my view, the right way, I mean, I can't really make decisions for people. In fact, I've had that happen a number of times. Like, oh, well, you're the expert. You tell me what to do, and I'm like, well, that's really not that's not really the way it works. I have to understand what you want, you know, how you feel about different, uh, you know, uh, things that are out there in the market and for yourself. I mean, it's all got to fit into your own personal situation because what's right for one person is not necessarily right for another person. And you really have to get in, in my business, you have to really get into the personality of the individual. Now that's not necessarily, you know, true with a generator, but you still have to understand what are the specific needs of the generator? When do you think you might actually need it? And how often do you think you're going to need it? And things like that. Um, and, and, you know, under what circumstances. So I, so there's a different set of questions that we all have to go through to make sure that we're really matching the right product or service with, with what our clients actually need. And of, of course. course, at least in my business, the goal is you want them to be happy so that the other person who needs that particular product or service is going to be, hey, that person did a really good job. If you need that, maybe you should, you know, talk to them. Because uh, right, they're going right. to help you out as well. Because referrals are, are are like kind of the, the the ultimate, in my opinion, at least in my business, it is. I mean, that's really um, the the ultimate sales, right? When you have a client that's advocating, say, "Hey, I had a great experience," and you should have a similar experience as well, and they typically do. So, um, yeah, right. And that's what it's all about. We want to make them happy, so to speak, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And and you know, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting statement that you made there, in the sense that you know, prospects expect you to be the expert. A bad prospect says in the first five minutes, tell me what you got for me. Tell me how you can help me. And that may not be a good fit. And that's where we talk about staying behind the pendulum. Hey, listen, you may not be a good fit for me. But really, our best fit clients allow us to do that exploration. And we, we're, we're allowed to do that. We're given that because we're going to make a determination as to whether or not we have the right product or solution. If they feel comfortable that you will guide them, facilitate a conversation that leads them to the best possible outcome, which could not include, which may not include you. Right. They will be more vulnerable and they will absolutely fall in love with you. And you know what? If you don't have the right product or service set, then we're comfortable enough to walk away. And if we do, then chances are they're going to become your client. But no, without I, exploration, I, I, we can't yeah. get there. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because we're not, you know, the, every relationship is not meant to be, so to speak, right? It has to be the exactly, correct one for yeah. both of you. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah. So, um, so what are the, some of the tools you see being used out there? We have a few minutes left uh, that are that are kind of being used to develop that kind of trust when we're in kind of when we're in this online world more than we used to be. Whereas when you know, it used to be in person, now a lot more of that relationship is going to be online. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll take this kind of like to a, from step one to a step two. I think I think number one is doing things a little bit differently, being genuine, also having that mindset. And Kurt, you just said it. Not every prospect is meant to become a customer. Mm -hmm. So once we can break down those doors, and actually, this is the back end of the podcast. So so this is, if I share these next couple of nuggets and salespeople take this, my gut says they'll get more deals. Um, So imagine you've you've broken down some, some walls of communication. You're having a great conversation. There is a line that I love in the world of sales that I've been teaching for years that has become incredibly powerful in the last 18 months. And it's, it's a pretty simple one. It's, hey, Kurt, if, if you know, we may not do business together, but if, if you were going to make a decision on a product like this or a solution like this, when would you like to have this in place by? And that line does two things. Number one is it takes away the, the buyer-seller relationship by me saying, hey, Kurt, you may not choose to do business with me, that gives you your out. So psychologically, I put you in a very safe place. And then the moment I say, when would you like to have a solution like this or a product like this in place? 
if you give me a date, I know that you're serious about making a decision, especially if it's in the shorter term. So I know that I've got a pretty good prospect here. Doesn't guarantee that we're going to do business. It only guarantees that they're going to make a decision. But if I'm that salesperson that's operating a little bit differently than everybody else out there, I'm positioning myself really well. Now, the beauty of that also is, let's imagine you tell me I want to make a decision in the next 60 days. I have just been given a great opportunity to adjust my sales process around your decision date. Because I say, hey, Kurt, now it depends on the product. Some products may be a 60 day out decision. Some might be in the next six days. Some may be in the next six months or six years. I can build the process around the information you just gave me. So if it's 60 days, I can start to say, hey, Kurt, here's how we work with you. In the next 14 days, we're going to be back on the calendar and here's what we're going to talk about. And in 30 days, we're going to start talking about the contract if we decide to get to that point. And at the 45 day mark, if we're at that level, here's what's going to happen. We're going to review signatures and start to put an action plan in place. Does that work for you? And now you're falling into my selling process. So you've given me the line in the sand, the goal line, and I'm the sales guy who can adapt my entire process into your timing. And I've done it in a very gentle, nurturing way. And I like what you just did there because you really laid out a timeline uh, of, of being organized, so to speak, and knowing like almost what I need to do, right? Um, and you said, hey, here's the process you're going to need to go through to get to that decision in the next 60 days. I'm just going to kind of check in with you. If I'm the right partner, great. If I'm not, that's fine too. But the side note is either way, I'm going to be following the correct agenda to get to the decision within the 60 days that I'm trying to get to it. And from my perspective, that that tends to lead me to believe that you're kind of the expert on how to get this done within 60 days, right? You've so I'm going to lean a little before. towards you, even if I didn't really think about you in the first place. Like, yeah, you kind of know what I need to do here. I'm You're helping me out. If I'm the buyer, I'm going, this guy knows how to get me to the finish line. Right. He's been here, done that. He's the expert. And if we go back a little bit earlier in the conversation, Kurt, I, lo I love the way that you picked up on that. Go back to earlier in the conversation. I'm seeing a lot of ghosting going on. New right. clients come in. I'm getting ghosted all the time. I want to make it clear. Our Sandler clients don't get ghosted. That's the objective. Right. But if I build that timeline, I now build calendared events around that timeline. Right. Hey, we're going to get together in 14 days. Let's open up our calendar and find a day and time that works. At the conclusion of that meeting, we schedule out the next one. The likelihood of somebody ghosting you when they're on your calendar and when it's been agreed to goes way down. And, that's awesome, Dave. I, I, I hate to and cut you off. We've been, doing a great, we've been doing a great job here. I mean, I think that's awesome. As, as always, you do a fantastic job. Any final thought before we uh, break off here? You've been really great. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd say, you know, high level. Embrace technology. Um, get really comfortable with it. Do do things in your power that that are in the best interest of the of the prospect. When you act in your client's best interest, you will get the best possible outcomes. And that's why we always say a no is on the table. And I will say from a tactical technique standpoint, try to find out when they would want your solution in place. If you get that piece of data, you are getting a great opportunity to move a deal forward. Excellent. Thanks again, Dave. Uh, you've been listening to Master Your Finest. I'm Kurt Baker here with Dave Trapani. You can subscribe to this podcast and all the podcasts we have by going to masteryourfinances.us. Remember, together we can master your finances so you can enjoy financial peace of mind. That was this week's episode of Master Your Finances with Kurt Baker, Certified Financial Planner Professional. Tune in every Sunday at 9 a.m. to expand your knowledge in building and managing your wealth. Missed an episode? No worries. You can subscribe to a free weekly episode of Master Your Finances to listen to on your favorite podcasting platform. Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever. Master Your Finances is underwritten in part by Certified Wealth Management and Investment and Rider University. Rider offers continuing studies programs for adults who need flexibility. Want to add new skills to your resume? Take a continuing studies course at Rider University.